sailor by trade, or captain. That's what I do for a living. It's, uh, I love the job. It's taken me a lot of places in the world. I've met some incredible people, seen some overwhelming beauty that the ocean provides. Yeah, and uh, I've also seen a lot of damage in the ocean. And that damage is something that we've provided. Uh, the ocean's got some serious challenges. Climate change, overfishing, and plastic pollution are incredible uh, events in the ocean. The overfishing, I mean, consider the fact that uh, in January of last year, a single bluefin tuna sold on the Japanese open market for $396,000, a single fish. That's 526 bucks a pound. It's, you know, how, how, do you def how do you save an animal that's got that kind of a bounty on its head? Uh, climate change is really interesting. You know, the ice sheets are going away. I'm sure you hear about that all the time. And just in September of this year, just a couple of months ago, three guys in a 32-foot sailboat, nothing special, a little fiberglass sailboat, sailed what's called the Northwest Passage up over the top of Canada from Atlantic to Pacific. And they didn't need any special attention or, or assistance or anything. They just did it. The ice sheet's about 1.3 million square miles less than the average from 1979 to 2000. I think that's pretty significant. And plastic pollution's an incredible problem. Uh, most of you, I hope, have heard about uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the Pacific Gyre. It's called sometimes an island of trash out in the Pacific there. Well, hopefully you already know that that's not really true. There is no island of trash. However, the trash is in every part of every ocean and on shorelines where people have never been. It's, it's a real problem. Pr plastic kills, plastic destroys lives. Um, the great whales, sharks, seals, sea lions, get caught up in plastic debris, fishing nets, derelict lines, they entangled and drown. That's the greatest creatures ever been on our planet. You go out to Midway Island, perhaps you've seen the photography of a fellow by the name of Chris Jordan. He's got photographs of albatross chicks on Midway Island that have never managed to fly yet. They've not even fledged. They're dead on the, on the beach because their, their bellies are filled with plastic debris, and they've starved to death because they've stopped eating. Their bellies are full. And as they die on the beach, they decay, and their bellies open up to, the, to Mother Nature, and the plastic goes back in and starts it all over. And... Uh, Again, it's, it's a real problem all over the planet. In uh, 2000, in, in, excuse me, 1996, I was fortunate enough to have the O'Neill family in Santa Cruz, California, hire me and give me a job to create a little education program for kids in our community talking about the marine environment. This was an awesome opportunity. I thank them all the time. We, we really made a difference with those kids and it's changed my life. So in respect for that, I had the opportunity to do this again in 2004, did it for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. But this time, we started learning about plastic pollution in, in the ocean and the problems that it causes. And we taught that in our, in our little program there, and people really caught on to that, and they enjoyed it, and they, they got into this. They participated. The project that we had allowed them to pull the plastic trash out of the water on their own. They got their feet wet and their hands dirty, and they remembered that event. And, and that was the beginning of my plastics education. And the fact that we could, could teach these people and get them involved and get them interested, that, that, was, that was something that I really took away from that. After that program was up and running and on its own, I took a couple years off and built a house with my dad. What an awesome experience that was at this time of my life. And then it was time to go back to work. So my next job, took a, uh, a sailboat delivery down from California, down through the canal, coming up here to the East Coast. And we got down through the canal, and we had to wait on the uh, east side there, um, waiting for some serious weather to clear out of Florida, because we were at the wrong time of year. And so we waited for a week in a little place called San Blas Islands. You have to work on the boat, you know, when you're getting ready to go places and stuff. So we did our day's work and said, great, it's time to take a little time off. And, test our beer cooler, and we went to the nearby island, 
And when I say island, it's kind of a, that's, that's a little bit grand for this thing. It's uh, only about 40 foot by 30 foot. But uh, we're out there, get there on the island. It was about getting towards the low tide in my beer can, and I went for a little walk around the island. And uh, in just a short period of time, I found a plastic bucket, a plastic type burlap sack, and enough plastic trash to fill both of those. And uh, this included syringes and other plastic things. It was really obvious to me that this had come from a long distance away. It was faded. It was covered with you know, sea life and growth. It was broken and brittle and little pieces and stuff. So we knew that it didn't come from the folks that lived in this island community. It came from us. And by us, I don't mean us on the boat that day. I meant us here, here, civilization, our, our prepackaged society that every day it takes us further and further away from the natural environment that we're so dramatically impacting. I remember a little bit from my high school education. One of the things was a quote by a fellow by the name of Malcolm X. He says, if you're not part of the solution, you must be part of the problem. And I decided then and there that I wanted to be part of the solution to this problem. So when I got home, I was busy. I was working feverishly trying to think, what, what is it that I can do? How can, how can I make a difference? Luckily for me, at that point, I ran into an old friend of mine, Nick Droback. We started talking about this stuff. We both had ideas. We both had very similar ideas about what to do. And we have a complementary set of skills. As I say, I'm a boat driver. Nick is an attorney. I think that's a pretty good mix. <laughs> so we formed a little project we call the Clean Oceans Project. I'd like to have a chance to have you all check us out online when you get a chance. The Clean Oceans Project, our mission is to eliminate plastic pollution from the oceans. I realize that's a big, big job. Many people say that's insurmountable. But it's the effort of doing something that, that really matters. So the Clean Oceans Project, again, as I say, that, that's, that's an enormous task. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? We, we, we realize that we had to be methodical about this. You can't do everything at once. Our idea of a solution to the plastic pollution problem, research is important. I like to characterize the research that's ongoing these days as approximately two dozen uh, research trips over the course of one dozen years. It's a little bit different. I've been using that, mon that modem for a little while, but that's, very, that's, that's not a lot of information, and it's, we don't know a whole lot more than that. A lot of the stuff we're doing is guessing. So we need research. We need education. We need to inform you. This is education right here. You guys are learning something about this, so this is part of that. This is actually step one in your education program, becoming aware. And that research doesn't do us any good unless we give you that information. And then what we do with that information is really important. We need to change public policy. We need to change our habits, our personal habits, our community habits. So again, public policy is the next stage. Those are all going on. There's other organizations working on that. But to our knowledge, there isn't any other organization that's doing an effective job working toward an actual cleanup. And that's the missing ingredient, remediation or cleanup for this. That alone is a huge task. Figure you can't, again, you can't do everything at once. You have to break it down into small pieces. And so we figured, what are the components to cleaning up the pollution that's in the ocean? First, you have to be able to find it. Then you have to get it out of the water, and then you have to do something with it. Great. So finding it, that was actually one of the biggest challenges. We were really lucky. We've got some incredible mentors and uh, advisors and such. One of them is a, an oceanographer for the US Navy, and he told us about this uh, technology and this group that was working to get derelict fishing nets out of the water to, to keep them from going up on the beaches in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands National Marine Sanctuary. It's called the High Seas Ghost Net Project. It was a NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. It was a NOAA project in the early 2000s. And they did it. They spent a bunch of years, a bunch of money, and they came up with a solution, a method of finding these derelict fishing nets. It, it worked out really well. But it wasn't cost effective. It was done, government can use a lot of money sometimes. And, and uh, they put it on the shelf because they couldn't afford to continue. A couple years later, my partner and I walk in the door and said, we've heard you've got some amazing things. We asked questions. They were so great. They gave us all the information that we wanted and their own phone numbers and stuff. 
That's the kind of cooperation that we're getting. The doors are opening everywhere. So how does that work? The, the, the GhostNet project figured out that um, it's basic oceanography, actually. The ocean organizes stuff, puts it into little places, and you have to figure out where it's tucked that stuff away to go look for it. So you start off wanting to see the whole ocean at once. We start off with satellite navigation, OK? What can a satellite tell us about plastic trash in the ocean? Well, satellites can't see the trash, in spite of what you may see on James Bond-type movies. What satellites can see is differences between hot and cold, say the temperature of water in Hawaii and the water in Alaska. Where the two meet, we call that a convergence zone. And the GhostNet project proved that the convergence zones have higher concentration of debris. That's the same with blue and green. The, the water up in Alaska and California is green. Down near Hawaii, again, it's blue. Where those two meet, convergence zones. And you can see that very simply looking on satellite charts. And that, again, gets us into areas of concentration of trash. The next level of our location technology, your pops up here. There we go. This is high frequency radar. This is San Francisco Bay. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge right here. And what you see are what's called vectors, little arrows pointing. And that's in the, the color here on the left, the color bar. It gives you the speed of the water, and the arrows give the direction. What you're able to see is you look down here near Treasure Island, you can see that the water from Treasure Island is kind of moving up there to the north, and above Treasure Island, it's moving to the west, and where the two meet, that's where I would expect to find a debris concentration. The current is showing me that. You can see where things are going. This is a, an iPad, an iPhone application called Bay Currents in San Francisco. It's excellent. I, I use it all the time. And actually, I'm going to be uh, using it uh, with some sailboat racing one of these days, because this will also give us a little bit of advantage there. But <laughs> wait a second. Everybody's going to see this. Oh, well. <laughs> Amazing technology. We're, tr we're working with uh, the company Kodar that created it to take this offshore, put it on a boat. And that's going to be our second level of location technology. So the first one gets us into the county, if you will. This one gets us into the neighborhood. Now we want to find out what street that trash is on. So we've taken another cue from another organization, the US Coast Guard and Customs and Border Patrol. What's that got to do with plastic trash? It has to do with surveillance. They use, you've heard of drone aircraft, and they fly those around and look at things. And that, that worked out really well. The GhostNet project used drone aircraft to find their concentrations of debris and such. But there are logistical issues with that, and that was one of the cost-effective things. We decided, again, to go with this surveillance technology called Aerostats, SkyDoc Aerostats. Now that's an aerostationary platform, a balloon, a, a tethered to the vessel. When we drive around, you can use high resolution cameras. You can put your radar up there. And you can see, if, if I'm down on the deck of the boat and I'm six feet above the horizon, or excuse me, six feet above the, the surface of the water, my horizon's about six miles away. If I get up to 500 feet, that changes to 26 miles. That gives us a lot better view of what's going on around us. We can drive straight to those little streams of debris, because again, that's what the ocean organizes it into for us. And then kind of mow that lawn with our specialized equipment. So great, now we've located it. Awesome. Oh, one other thing. If we use infrared sensing, FLIR, forward-looking infrared, that, that also enhances our efficiency. It allows us to work at night half our time, so we've doubled our efficiency. That's impressive. That's, in, that's important for us. Energy efficiency is an essential component here. So now we've, um, we've located the debris. We can use commercial um, operations for getting the debris out of the water. They are cost effective and competitively priced. And, uh, and we don't have to worry about that part. That's, that that technology is taken care of for the moment. So we've got it out of the water. Now we've got to figure out what are we going to do with it. This is an incredible game-changing device right here. A company in Japan called Blessed creates this little unit. When we first started the project, my partner found out that there was technology available that can take that plastic trash and cook it and make it into fuel. Wow, incredible. That's, that, that's an amazing thing for us. It's perfect. It's exactly what we needed. 
But these things are as big as a building and process 50,000 pounds a day. There's no time that I'm going to find 50,000 pounds of trash in a single day of looking around. So we wanted something that was smaller. We kept looking, we kept looking. Uh, I managed to see a little information about this unit. I contacted the group in Japan that makes it. We had a little dialogue, said, oh, that's exactly what I, I need to know more. How much does it cost? And all of a sudden, they went off the air. I couldn't contact them for a couple of months. I didn't know what had happened. Luckily, we've got a family friend that uh, runs a company in Tokyo, and I called Masahiro. I said, can you help me out? And he called the company themselves, and it turned out that they had been discovered, and their email was overloaded, and they just couldn't get back to everybody. And I was one of those emails that was stuck in there. And they said, we've learned our lesson. We've got a group in Washington State now that's distributing this device. Talk to them. I called them that night, and they said, you are in luck. Today is your lucky day. We're showing this system tomorrow. We've got two dozen people showing up at noon in LA. I live in Santa Cruz. That's a long ways. I said, I'll see you in the morning. And I drove. I got up at 4 AM. I drove to LA, all excited, helped them unload this. I was actually there before they were. And I knew a little bit about the technology. And I turned out to be the only person that showed up that day. So I got an earful of what this was. And they were really happy that I understood what was going on. And we got a great relationship going. And now we've got a bit of a partnership. And what this does for me, this particular machine is just a demonstration device. Essentially, we put a kilo of plastic uh, trash in here, types 2, 4, 5, and 6. I'll let you look that up when you get home. It brings the temperature up in three different levels, up to 800 degrees. First it softens it, then it liquefies it, then it turns it into a gas. The gas comes up, then bubbles through the water. We use water here because in, in the commercial units, there's just a chiller. You don't get to see anything. When you're doing demonstrations, you see the bubbles coming up. Something's happening. That's important. <laughs> so we use that, and out of a kilo of plastic waste, we'll get a liter of fuel in a small unit like this. The smallest units can do 500 pounds in a day. Now, that's a little more our liking. Okay? And it's small enough that we can put it onto a boat. We can take it out to sea. And again, part of our uh, problem is trying to be efficient enough that we end up cleaning more than we pollute. And so this allows us to do this. One of the other pieces of technology we use for doing exactly that, we want the vessel, the sailing vessel that we use it's not always going to be windy out there where we are working. This is solar. It's a solar panel. In 2008, that delivery I did down through the Panama Canal, when we got up to Massachusetts, we actually rolled out the very first solar-powered sail on the boat in Massachusetts. That can help us charge our batteries and move the boat when we don't have any wind, and it lessens our impact on the environment. All these things, all this efficiency, and we can make the plastic that we're cleaning up into fuel while we're on board so we don't have to take the plastic back to the beach and put it in some landfill and we don't have to go back in and fuel up as often. Again, our efficiency keeps ramping up. The, uh, the other thing that's really important about that efficiency level is that, uh, again, it allows us to stay out for longer periods of time and go further and it keeps our impact as minimal as possible. The other end of uh, how this is a game changer is what I call indirect action. If you walk around the many of the streets in, in America, we have bottle uh, recycle bills and such, where your bottles and cans are worth 50, 5 cents, 10 cents, something like that. And you don't see cans and bottles in the streets anymore because they're worth money. If this type of technology was available around the world in small units, put in, in local communities, we believe we can monetize that trash that's laying on the streets in many of the streets in America. Because again, kids that want to clean up the streets can come up with an arm full of plastic and turn it into money and then change that into ice cream cones. We think that's going to change the world. We think that's going to clean up the streets. <laughs> so it's important to A, understand that we have a problem and understand that we are the problem. We are getting the benefits of this plastic. It's making our lives better. It's making our lives easier. But it's also our responsibility for the pollution and the damage that it's causing. 
The Clean Oceans Project is working diligently to make a difference. But as hard as we work, if we clean up all, all the plastic that's out there, if we as a society don't stop dumping that plastic in the ocean, the damage is done and all the cleanup that we can do is not going to be for any good at all. Thank you. <laughs>